This is ODAT Chat, your instant connection to recovery and community, one day at a time. This podcast may contain strong language, sexual content, and spiritual truth. Listener discretion is advised. Hi, friend. Welcome to another episode of the Oda Chad podcast. In case you're new here, my name is Arlena and I'll be your host. This is a podcast where my guests share their stories of alcoholism and addiction and their journey to recovery. For information on today's episode and to access past episodes, please visit odatchat.com. Today, my conversation is with Wendy Adamson, author of Mother Load, a memoir of addiction gun violence, and finding a life of purpose. But before we jump in, I just want to share a couple of resources for you. So first is audible.com. I talk a lot about books, including uh, the one by today's guest. And while you may not have a lot of time to sit and read, you might find it more convenient to consume audiobooks during your commute while exercising or when you're not listening to podcasts, heaven forbid. You can actually get your first audio book for free when you visit odatchat.com and look for the audible image on the right. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. The next resource is SoberLifeSchool.com. Over the last 25 years, I have attended an obscene amount of workshops, spent countless hours on worksheets, therapy, all that stuff, and I've read hundreds of books, and I have condensed all my favorite and most transformative lessons into online courses so that you can experience a breakthrough faster and cheaper than I did. To learn more, just visit SoberLifeSchool.com. Um, Okay, so back to the episode with Wendy. I have to say, Wendy is like a kindred spirit who was referred to me by the ever so fabulous author, Amy Dresner. Uh, Wendy has been helping others recover from alcoholism and addiction for over two decades. She's such a caring and beautiful soul, and she brought such knowledge and wisdom to this interview. I've actually found myself passing along things she she has shared, I wish I could talk, several times since we spoke, and I love that. So with that, please enjoy this episode with Wendy Adamson. All right, Wendy, thank you so much for joining me on the ODAT Chad podcast. Well, thanks for having me. I'm delighted. You are such a champ. We kept having all these scheduling (laughs) issues. We did. Mostly because I'm totally unorganized. (laughs) Well, you just moved, you know, so I I understand. And the lights went out. Your electricity went out. Your electricity went out this morning. Um, So, yes, that you are a champ. Thank you so much for hanging in there and coming on because... um, I feel like this is such an important, um, this is going to be a really helpful conversation because you as a woman with children and uh, you also have long-term sobriety um, can offer so much healing to women who suffer from motherhood guilt. Yeah, I really wanted to, in my book, uh, write to those women that have guilt and really, you know, show how you get the, you can heal the family system and, I uh, and forgive yourself. But, you know, it, it obviously is a process and it, it, it's easier said than done, but it is possible. Self-forgiveness is a process. That is, that is the truth. Yeah. And, um, so let's backtrack a little bit. So you've been a drug and alcohol counselor for over 20 years now. Correct. Yeah, you've had lots of experience. You yourself have been sober since November of 93. And um, you have put all your, as much as you can, all the most valuable lessons um, in your book called Mother Load. That is great. I love that name. That is such a great title. Um, so I will definitely leave a link to your book in the show notes. Um, it can be purchased on Amazon, also 
on wendyadamson.com. And uh, sounds like you have some events on there too and some links to other podcasts. So we'll definitely put that in the show notes uh, for the listeners to check it out and get to know you a little better. Um, Yeah, but uh, so... Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, where this all started. Can you give me sort of a brief overview of, you know, where your, maybe your family of origin, maybe where your disease started and and how you got sober? Well, um, I had a mother who was schizophrenic. And for the first seven years of my life, um, I think I was in fight or flight mode or fight, flight or freeze uh, because it was like we never knew, you know, who was going to be there. Like if I got home from school, um, she had many psychotic breaks and she was suicidal. So, um, you know, this created uh, extreme hypervigilance on my part. And uh, she ultimately ended up killing herself when I was seven years old. Seven. And, oh, yeah. Wendy, I'm so sorry. Well, thank you. It's um, that, you know, and, and, you know, I must say that a lot of the stuff around my mother was supposed to be a secret because my dad didn't want the neighbors to know, went to um, Catholic school, he didn't want the nuns to know. And so he was always telling us, you know, not to tell anybody. So we were kind of sworn into this conspiracy of silence, which um, created a great deal of shame. You know, in hindsight, I can see I was like bogged down with shame. And so uh, I found out like the real way that, you know, he had lied to me about her death, probably to protect me, you know, and said she had a heart attack. And I found out how she actually died when I was 14. And that sort of fueled my, you know, uh, my alcoholism and my addictions. Uh, I've, you know, felt a great deal of guilt because when I was a little girl, and she would have her psychotic breaks, I would wish that she was dead, you know, like any kid that is scared of their parents or angry with their parents. And so when she did die, I, you know, in my magical thinking as a child, you know, was still developing brain, the architecture was just being built. Uh, I blamed myself for for her death. So um, my dad was alcoholic. And then my late, my brother later became schizophrenic. Um, so there was a lot of mental illness and alcoholism, you know, and um, yeah. And yeah. go ahead. No, that's really intense. So you're, um, when does, when does schizophrenia kick in? Is it typically in adolescence? Well, it's tip it used to be around early twenties, but now they're finding, especially with um, the pot, uh, that is out there these days, the strong level of THC, mm-hmm. that it's inducing psychotic breaks. I also work in a, a teenage um, and adolescent treatment program mm-hmm. called Polaris. And um, sometimes these kids, you know, when there's, their brains are still developing and they smoke pot, they can have a psychotic break or episode. Well, what does that look like? What does a psychotic um, break look like? I don't know that I've ever seen one. Well, um, extreme mania, uh, delusions, uh, paranoia, uh, erratic behavior, uh, violence, suicide, suicidal ideation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Mania or, or both. Right. It does, uh, like bipolar, does it look like bipolar or it something? It can. Yeah, it can. Yeah. That can be really, um, tricky to diagnose, I would imagine. Right. So, okay, let me backtrack just a little bit. I was curious about your dad. So your, you said your dad was also alcoholic. Um, what kind of an alcoholic? Because I know there's like varying degrees. Like was he the go to work and drink at night kind of guy? Was he violent or just absent? Or um, Well, he was absent, yes. And he would drink every night he'd get home from work. He would start drinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, it uh, obviously it progressed, and um, his drinking became. He would become bitter and belittling, more abusive um, in his, the way he spoke to us. Uh, so um, 
it was, you know, it was not a happy environment to grow up in. No, that sounds awful. Um, and, and, you know, I'm always, sometimes I'm just uh, surprised that people can survive their childhood sometimes. Yeah. You know, it sounds like you, you had a lot, of, a lot of trauma to deal with growing yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. And when did you yourself start drinking? Well, I started drinking, I think, around 14, 15. And oh, when you found out the truth about your mom? About the same time. You know, it was like I had extre- a lot of emotions and um, a lot of feelings of rage and uh, of being silenced and kind of being shamed, what I felt like. And um, so I couldn't metabolize these feelings. And so alcohol was the way I metabolized them. And then ultimately, which led later to Drug, you know, a lot of drugs. Uh, what kind of, what kind of, what, how old were you when you started using drugs? Um, I started experimenting around the same time, 15. It, it happened. It pretty, all comes together, huh? It all, yeah, it came together pretty quickly. Yeah. You know, I was looking for relief and I was trying to get it any way I could. Yeah, I've often thought, you know, that, you know, I was self medicating around that same age, around 14. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just a rough, rough time. You know, that's a rough age. Con, you yeah. know, and in, in conjunction with an alcoholic father and all the, you know, when you talk about um, rage and shame, yeah. those are such powerful emotions to try to, you know, I, I love that word you use, metabolize. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you can't metabolize all that. I had such a feeling of intensity. And when your feelings are suppressed and you're told not to talk about it, where is it going to go? You know? It starts leaking. It does. It always comes out sideways, it seems. Yeah, like. it does. Yeah, whatever we don't deal with head on uh, comes out sideways. Um, okay, so, and that was so, how long? So, you started using drugs? Did you, was it just like pot? And um, Well, back when I was growing up, there was like uh, Red Devils, you know, which were sleeping pills. Oh. And there were barbiturates. Okay. And, um, you know, that was like taking a pill and getting drunk. It, I mean, you didn't have to drink the alcohol, actually, but you got the effect of being, you know, high and uh, medicated, you know. Right. So, you know, they were in parents' medicine cabinets. That my dad kept them by his bedside. That's they crazy. Were, yeah, it was just like, Yeah. They were around. They were around. Okay, so so this goes on for how long? So this goes on for way too long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, way too long. Yes, too, yeah, too long. So you know, during this time, I stumbled into a guy. You know, when I was around sixteen, that I would ultimately. I mean, we didn't stay together all of that time, but at twenty-two. We hooked back up, and I actually started doing heroin at that point with him. At 22? At 22. And um, that went on for a bit. And then um, I, we, we ultimately had two kids, two boys. And so that slowed everything down. And I, you know, um, you know it just, I, the, the thing that, I, you know, I would like to say is that, well, I said I would never be like my mother. You know, I didn't know that when you say never, it's like giving the universe exact coordinates to where you're going to later land. Oh, oh, can we use that in a positive way? I will never be rich, Wendy. Yes, I'll never be rich. I'll (laughs) never win the lottery. I'll never write another book. Just list them all now. But isn't that the truth? If you say it's, never, you're right. It's like, yeah. What so is weird. that? That's so weird. We need to we need to like do some quantum physics studies. Well, to- yeah, I think it is quantum physics. I think right. that the you know the energy that never gonna do that. It's like you're unconsciously pulling yourself in that direction. You know. I heard somewhere that the universe doesn't hear the negatives. So whatever you say, like, um, you never say I don't want, you know, cause all the he- universe hears is I want. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be lonely. I don't want to be 
poor. I don't want to be, the universe just says, I want to be poor. I want to be lonely. Right, right. Um, that's trippy. Okay, yeah. so sorry, I didn't mean to digress into some no, it's okay. woo-woo area, but I, I feel like science is catching up to woo-woo stuff, so. Well, I'm all into the woo-woo stuff. Are you good? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. I don't know why I pretend like I'm not into it either, but I totally am. <laughs> yeah. Well, quantum physics is fascinating. It's, is science yeah. and, and spirituality where they intersect, are beginning yeah. to inter- intersect. Yeah, science yeah. is really starting to explain all that stuff and yeah. legi- legitimizing everything that, you know, what was dismissed as, you know, woo woo. I don't mm-hmm. like that term. I kind of like it, but anyways. Um, okay, so wow, heroin. So um, how did you? How did you get off heroin? I either it's such an epidemic now. People are so hooked on the opiates and, you know, I see all these Facebook groups where people are just struggling to get off of it. How did you do it? Well, like, um, I'm sure you've heard the expression, I just changed seats on the Titanic. You know, I got on methadone, you know, which was a state uh, run program. And that gave me the ability to, um, you know, uh, you know, work sometimes or you know i had i had two boys and um you know get them to school or get take them to the park because i you know that was a game changer you know um but um i i'm just gonna fast forward to back what i was saying you know that um i swear i'd never be like my mother and uh at 38, she had a psychotic break and killed herself by drowning herself in a bathtub after cutting her wrist. I know, oh. pretty uh, horrific. And, the, and in, in the bathtub, she pulled a, a huge shipping trunk over her full of photographs of her kids and her wedding. It was like very much a metaphor, like drowning under her inventory, you know. Of wow. her. So at 38, fast forward, you know, I'm um, in my 30s, my late 30s. I have a psychotic break, and I'm doing methamphetamine at the time, and um, completely hadn't slept for days. And I ended up shooting my husband's girlfriend in the arm. You know, yeah. You usually, you look so sweet. Yeah, no, I know. I clean up well. <laughs> you <laughs> shot that bitch in the arm. I shot that bitch, man. <laughs> I did. I deserve that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. no. I no. just winged her. I just winged her. <laughs> no, but, um, you are a badass. It was, yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's like talking about another character. When I talk about who I was, it's like talking about somebody else. But I was 38, the same mother, same age as my mother, and I had lost my mind. But once you lose your mind, how do you get it back? Oh, no, how do you? And that's where the book starts is like, it starts with a bang, you know, it starts right there because it's the, it's my unraveling. And when my, when things start falling apart in my life, who knew now I can see in hindsight, they were falling, falling in place for me to get sober. Mm -hmm. I became desperate enough, you know, to do something else, to try something else because I was hard headed, you know, completely hard headed. Yeah. And that leveled me. You know, there's nothing like going to jail for assault with a deadly weapon and uh, getting sentenced to a year, you know. And okay, you you did get sentenced to a year. And so who took care of your boys? Well, my my, um, grand, they're eight years apart. Mm -hmm. So my grandmother, I mean, I hit, sorry. His grandmother took care of my youngest, and my oldest boy was 16. And uh, he ended up getting in some trouble of his own and going to juvenile hall. So, you know, that's like, you know, the transgenerational trauma that was happening within the family system that I was becoming my mother and my son was becoming me. That, you know, we were all unconscious playing this, this, um, uh, you know, this unconscious repetition of history repeating itself. I mean, the apple 
literally fell in my lap, you know? Yeah. So, so, you know, needless to say, when I got out of jail, there was a lot of uh, guilt and shame all of it wrapped up around that. You know, what's really interesting. I, I heard early in recovery that uh, we recreate our family of origin as adults to, so that our adult self can sort of parent the inner child through that situation. But it, it repeats itself because we don't ever have this, we never learn how to do it different. So we end up just repeating it. Well, it's the neural pathways, you know, in the brain. You know, it's like they've been like the architecture that I was speaking of as a child was being built, you know, and uh, that, it, you know, uh, Carl Jung has a quote says um, something like uh, that, which is uh, remains unconscious will direct your life and you will continue to to call it fate, you know, until you wake up, um, until somebody wakes up and, uh, you know, fortunately, I feel like that, like I finally woke up, it finally got my attention. I, you know, sober, um, God, it was, it was really, really difficult at the, you know, when I first was getting sober, because I had so much guilt that Every decision I made around my kids was like, um, you know, coming from guilt, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. and somebody in, told me that, you know, if you bring guilt into the relationship, if you bring guilt into the de your decision making, it's tainted. You know, you have to find the love and come from that space. And, uh, you know, that was something I learned to do is like to be loving to myself and let myself off the hook inevitably. Tell me a little bit about, um, so you, you did talk about being desperate enough to want to be different. Um, how did you, can you, how did you get sober? Like, can you walk me through like the first 30 days or like, how do you, how did you even get to that place? I would imagine you had a series of bottoms. Well, when I got out of jail, Mm -hmm. um, I had, you know, I had burned my bridges, all of my bridges and a woman that taught self-esteem classes in the county jail, uh, sponsored me through a program for women that she was involved with. And she took me to, um, a women and children's transitional living housing. Okay. So that's where I first started. It was in Santa Monica. It's called Claire Foundation. And so I stayed at their Women and Children's Center. I was required to go to meetings. Uh, okay. So, um, you know, I was not fully, you know, uh, at the beginning, not fully engaged in it. You know, it's like going, I was very skeptical that it could work, you know, I'm fine if it works for you, but, it, uh, you know, you don't know where I come from. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I experienced as a child. All I was terminally unique. So, mm. uh, uh, so you know, it was difficult. I had a lot of anxiety. My self inner dialogue was um, destructive, to say the least. I, you know, was just constantly berating myself. That self loathing and self hatred. You know, all of those feelings that I had that I initially metabolized with drugs and alcohol, I needed to find some relief some way else. Uh, you know, uh, the first 30 days, you know, anxiety, uh, panic attacks, hardly could make it to the market. You know, I got on welfare, you know, and uh, cause I didn't, I didn't know I was, I was out of jail. I have a rap sheet. Uh, how am I going to be, uh, you know, uh, self-supporting. Mm -hmm. you know? So I got on welfare initially. And um, so I, I, you know, I started going to these meetings and I started over time. Not, it took a while. I wouldn't say the first 30 days, but I started um, connecting with people and mm -hmm. started devel developing a community. And um, that was really key for me is having a community. And it doesn't matter where you get 
the community. But as long as you have people that are going to answer your calls when you're like panicking or, you know, you don't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's huge. Like when I sponsor women, I require them to do what I call, I just call them willingness calls. And a a willingness call means for yourself that you're willing to take action. Right. Even if it's uncomfortable to to reach out and connect. And I require that they do it like um, three times a week. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, call one person once a week, you know, you know, call, you know, call them once a week, but you have like three people you can call so that you're current with at least three people. So that when the shit hits the fan, you don't have to spend a lot of time on the backstory. You can just kind of get right into solution. And, um, yeah, so I, I would definitely agree that building community is like take, takes top priority. Yeah. Well, it's, again, you're building uh, neural pathways, new neural pathways, you know, and, um, you know, this is contrary action. You know, I know that ultimately I, I um, started calling people and just leaving messages. These, this was the day when they had answer machines and there wasn't cell phones. So right. I would call people when they were at work and leave <laughs> yes. a message because I, that way I didn't have to interact, you know? And so yeah, I just, but it's a step in the right direction even. It is, it is, you know, it was totally contrary action because I was so, I was a, a self-reliant, non-compliant, you know? <laughs> so I, yeah, yeah. So it was like, I had to break that pattern um, and start, you know, letting, letting people in basically. And it was like putting my toes in and then wading up to my knees, you know? So, yeah. Just like those baby steps, huh? True. Yeah. So were you, what kind of meetings were you doing? Was it like NAAA type meetings? AA. AA. AA meetings? Yeah. And were you, um, how did you, how did you get off the uh, methadone? Oh, I was in jail. I mean, that was all in jail. I was already oh, off. Okay. So you like, so while you were in jail, you got off. I was of off everything. everything. Yeah. Okay. So that was sort of forced. <laughs> yeah. Before, I mean, yeah. Or, or it was divine intervention, you know? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Okay. Yeah. Cause there is, and how do you like, I don't know what, I never know how to feel about like Suboxone. I, I know that uh, there's a lot of controversy in the recovery community about whether you should be on it or not, or do you have an opinion about that? Oh, I have a big one. <laughs> <laughs> Lay it on my fist. No, no I, mean, um, I, you know, as someone that was on methadone for a long time, uh, I think that, uh, there are people that may need Suboxone for harm reduction, but I think that, uh, you know, it is just uh, for profit for a lot of doctors. I worked in a detox uh, for a long time, and it was when Suboxone was rolled out, you know, it was, um, I was working there. And what ultimately started happening, I was trying to get clients to go to rehab and to get more time, you know, time under the belt. And doctors were trying to get the the clients into their office for Suboxone maintenance, you know? And so um, I'm not a big fan of it. You know, I I think it's, um, it has its place, but I think it's abused just like every other, like big pharma, you know? Sure, sure. a lot of drugs that are abused and overprescribed. Right. Okay. Well, that's fair. I mean, I don't, I don't personally have experience. So I just, I never know what to think about these things. I've sponsored girls who are on it and I don't feel like I can be useful because um, I don't really understand it. And I would say get off of it. But um, I mean, wouldn't the goal be to be off everything eventually well, yeah, I mean, that's my goal. And it's <laughs> unfortunately not everybody else's goal. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah, they, it, it's called harm reduction. Harm reduction. Okay. Yeah. And um, but I don't consider played. those people sober. You know, I mean, okay. I didn't consider myself sober because I was going to a methadone clinic and getting a dose, you know. And right. Yeah, because yeah. you're you're on drugs, basically. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense to me. So thank you for clarifying clarifying that for me personally. Um, so 
Listen, it's been so much time since you got sober and you have ha- you have so much experience working with people. What are some of the, um, you know, there's some common pitfalls. I would imagine people, you know, relapse around relationships or financial issues. Um, what do you see? But there are also very common, um, should I say like, healing exercises or things that people can do to um, help themselves get better? What are some of the things that you would recommend people do? I know in Mother Lode, you probably talk a lot about this. Do you want to cover some of that? Yeah. In Mother Lode, I do talk about, um, I go into detail the different uh, pitfalls I had in my early sobriety and uh, things that I did. And um, what, what I, you know, I think that for me, uh, initially what happened and changed everything is that I had no um, defense against kindness. People were kind to me, you know, and as much as of a badass I was trying to be at the time, I was really scared. I, you know, it was persona, you know, just to, to keep myself safe, but people were kind. And how do you respond to kindness? It's like, what? You know, it's like you, you it's like, it, it floors me even now. So oh, really? that, yeah, I just think, I think we need to be kind enough to one another. I think it's important, you know? Oh, absolutely. But do you still, do you still have moments where someone's kind to you and it catches you off guard? People, yeah. I mean, it, it just can touch me. It gets me right here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It does. It just gets me. The, I, you know? Yeah. I mean, I get that. Like, um, especially when I'm in a moment of vulnerability, when someone's like, have you ever been like on the verge of tears and you're like holding your shit together and someone goes, Oh, I see your pain. And then it's like, "Ah, (laughs) are you okay? Oh no, I'm not. No, I'm not freaking out. Yeah. (laughs) Freaking out. Yeah. Well, I don't freak out so much anymore. Uh, thankfully I used to freak out a lot. But I think what you were talking about, tools that I used, I I remember when I was early in sobriety and I started like having these panic attacks, it was like this constant critic in my head, Mm -hmm. criticizing every single thing I did, every mistake I made when I got a job, um, you know, filing medical charts in a, a doctor's office. There was this constant critic that was so hard. And I mean, hearing that over and over, you know, there's a, there's a relationship between what you think and how you feel. So I started um, making labels at that job that I got that said, everything is all right, you know, and I made just a bunch of them. Everything is all right. I put it on my mirror. I put it in my car. I put it in my, on my refrigerator. Everything is all right. I put it on my checkbook. Everything is all right. And even when I opened the checkbook and I looked inside and I saw zeros, I go, no, it's not. No, it's not. It's not all right. And I close it. Yes, it is. Everything is all right. For today, I'm okay. You know, and it was like, it was this self-soothing voice that I was creating, uh, a voice that, um, if you will, that became stronger and began to 12-step the committee so that when the panic started taking hold, I could, I had to train myself to everything is all right. Everything and like take stock. Okay. I have food. I have a place to live. My kids are okay. You know, everything is all right. So it was like, you know, learning how to self-soothe because when you have a mother that is schizophrenic and you grow up in that kind of, there's no, your primary care person is not taking care of you and not telling you everything is all right. And everything isn't all right anyway. So um, I had to I had to learn how to parent myself, and then being a mom became you know my priority, uh, ultimate priority in sobriety is like making amends to my kids and being there for them, you know. And that was you know tricky because I mean it was it was hard. I didn't have an example growing up, but I. I had, I had women that were around me by, at that point that, um, I will call mentors or guides that, um, gave me valuable direction and, you know, that I used and I implemented my relationships because my 
older son was got out of juvenile hall. He was getting in trouble. He was angry at me, just like I had been angry at my dad, mm-hmm. you know. And so history's repeating itself, you know. And and you know, I remember one day he was, you know, we got in an argument. Our typical mo was he would say something, and I would defend myself, and then it would escalate, you know. And instead of engaging this one time, I said the serenity prayer in the middle. I was washing the dishes. He was like barking right like next to my ear and just like just going off on me. And I said the serenity prayer. And then I turned around and I said, you know, that woman doesn't live here anymore. She doesn't live here anymore. And I could see the, like the wind come right out of his, I mean, he didn't know how to respond because I stopped doing the dance. I didn't do what I always did, which was to engage and defend my point of view. There was no need to defend, you know? Wow. We can stop doing this dance. Yeah, no, that's magical. It's like uh, like when one person changes. Do you ever see that? Do you remember that uh, therapist, Terry Bradshaw, he would talk about the family dynamic being yeah. like a baby mobile right. where it's like the uh, lever with two little things hanging on the ends. Yeah. And that's exactly what you were talking about. It's like you changed. And so he had to change because you didn't respond. He had to do something different. Well, it's the family system. You know, it's the relationships. Like when at the, at the place, like I told you, where we work, um, you know, the teenager is the, the um, designated patient, you know, and, um, and everybody can point to the, the kids saying, this is the problem. But we require the whole family to come in for intensive fa- uh, family work because mm-hmm. it is a system. And if you send that child back into the, uh, a toxic system, the same thing's going to happen. You have to give everybody the tools. Yeah. Did your, did your son get tools as well? Did you guys, is he sober as well? Well, he's not, I mean, he's sober. He doesn't, um, he doesn't go to any program or anything. I mean, but, um, so he's got kids. My older son's got kids. Uh-huh. And he is parenting. He's become, he's become an, like, um, an amazing caregiver to him. them. His okay. two boys are incredible athletes. He shows up every practice, every game for them. So I, you know, it was like I became the mother that I never had. And he became the father that he never had. Mm -hmm. So it's like something, there's a ripple effect that happens with the addiction and alcoholism. There's a ripple effect that happens when somebody's committed to recovery and changing. I wanted to change the trajectory of my family's lineage from alcoholism and addiction, mental illness, to one of recovery and healing. Mm -hmm. And And I can see the ripple effects, you know, Oh, that's so, I feel like that's going to give people so much hope because, you know, that's, that's what we're in this game for, right? It's, it's to share the message that even though it can start out in a very dysfunctional, painful, unhealthy way that by, you know, by your example, you use the tools, uh, you did change the trajectory of your family's life. And now you're passing along that information you know, not only to the next generation, but to all the kids and families that come in through the programs you participate in. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's really powerful. It's very subtle. And as um, a mother with guilt, I wanted to be, I wanted it, you know, to be okay instantly. It's Mm -hmm. just, is not the way it happened. And that's, but I wrote this book for, for you know, mothers that are carrying you know a lot of guilt, or or daughters that are that are mad at their mothers, you know, or mm-hmm. any parent that has just made any mistakes, that I I believe that I believe in the power um, of transformation. That that you know, I mean, it's just happened within my family. I've seen it. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I've seen it too in, in multitudes of ways. And I'm always curious about the um, the process. So, it, you know, and I'm talking to a lot of women right now who are early in recovery who are mothers and they carry so much guilt. What, what would you like to say to those moms who are, you know, and then, you know, what happens is um, they do, um, they ha- have no boundaries, right? So they are, are parenting out of guilt, meaning um, yeah. they do every, then they go overboard. They do everything for the kids and they have no boundaries and then they come last. That's not healthy either, right? No, no. Um, so I, you know, have really strong boundaries and um, I didn't have strong boundaries initially, but working in a, a detox uh, with like having a caseload of, 12 to 15 clients Oof. all detoxing Oof. and so yeah uh, front lines I was like on the front lines and um, you get good at boundaries I bet yeah, good at, yeah and I had a good boss that was strong Al-Anon and she I she had an open door policy I'd be going into her, her Leslie all the time asking what do I do I have a, a borderline you know if, just you know there were just so many situations so, um, but in setting boundaries, I, you know, what was funny is I became a people pleaser early in recovery. I just like, um, couldn't say no. And, um, so I, someone told me if I had it to set, you know, if somebody asked me to do something, you know, to pause before, you know, I said yes. And to, you know, let me think about it. Can I get back with you? That was the pause. Okay. So then I would go and I would ask myself, um, you know, is this something I I can do? Is this something I want to do? Why? Or am I feeling obligated? Am I afraid that I'm going to lose them as a friend? And then they said, if I have a choice between feeling resentful or feeling guilty when I set a boundary, go with feeling guilty. Guilt is what you feel when you start taking care of yourself. Resentment is what you feel when you're taking care of them. So oh, I had to, oh good. Yeah, isn't it isn't it just so, such a good barometer? Oh. If, I, if I get a moment to pause before I say yes to anything and I step back and I ask myself, well, you know, I really don't have time to help them move on Saturday. You know, so I'm gonna feel guilty, you know, I'm gonna be afraid that I'm gonna lose them as a friend. But if I say yes and I don't want to be there, I'm resentful. That is brilliant. That That's is brilliant. Helped me so much with boundaries. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I preach all the time, don't give beyond your level of giving without resentment. But I like this is way more concise. Um, yes. Choose guilty over resentful. Well, and what happens over time as you become uh, strong you know, boundaried, uh, you're not so guilty. You feel like, you know, you feel healthy. It's healthy to set boundaries with people. Um, I can't judge. I, when I was, you know, started raising my, my um, boys in sobriety, I could not judge my mothering skills based on their reaction, you know, and the same with counseling. I couldn't judge my counseling skills based on their reaction. Because if I'm letting them do what they want, they're as happy campers. But as soon as I, that boundary comes down, they're pissed at me. So I, it's not, it's like, I can't judge myself as being a bad mother because I'm setting a boundary. That's just the way they're going to react. And they yeah. need those boundaries. Yeah. I have found that they get mad at first, but then um, they come to accept it. It's like you put money in a soda can machine and it doesn't give you your soda. You People tend to kick the machine, shake the machine, you know, but uh, you learn over time to either not <laughs> put money in it or, you know, yeah. yeah. That's interesting that you talk about, uh, you said that uh, at first you feel guilty, but then it starts to feel healthy. It feels healthy, yeah. Yeah. What is that feeling of healthy? What does that What does that look like to you? Well, it's um, I think you know, healthy for me is like um, being like aware, self aware enough to 
know that if um, uh, if I'm feeling agitated and I haven't worked out, there you know I can connect the dots. Mm. Um, if I'm feeling overwhelmed and I've taken on too many too many commitments, I can connect the dots. That um, uh, healthy to me is uh, is about maintaining a connection with a higher power. And um, I've had a meditation practice since early on in sobriety. Oh, good. And I can always tell when I'm off the beam there, you know, that I haven't uh, been still or checked in, you know, through meditation or prayer. So, um, you know, and also, you know, uh, being of service, but not to the point where I'm resentful, you know. Right. Yeah, being of service, I feel like, is one of those things that's an esteemable act. That's one of the things that I teach in uh, building self esteem is, you know, service is a big part of building self esteem. But, but I think for the people pleasers, it's, it's important to be, to temper that with the um, guilty versus resentful. Yeah. That's really good. That's a great, very clear way of thinking of that. Yeah, it's a good barometer, and that's how I started really um, developing strong boundaries. And you know, people know know me for that and respect me for that. You know, but I worked with addiction, mental health, and and still do. And it's like you have to have boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's great. Um, so you've been doing, you've been doing lots of work. You mentioned you have some events coming up. Are you, do you teach classes or how can people interact with you? Well, I, I, it's on my website, I'm, but it's like in Los Angeles. Uh, oh, you're in LA. LA. Okay. So, uh, doing creative workshops. Um, myself and a, a therapist, uh, we're writing to heal workshops where we're going to do a deep dive and it's it's appealing to uh, women that are either writers and feel blocked, mm-hmm. or um, women that want to explore, you know, do a deep dive, you know, emotionally. So it's 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 called writing to heal. And then I'm doing um, a book uh, book soup, which is a bookstore here in Los Angeles, on the twenty fourth. It's all on my uh, website, so they can click on there. And yeah, Yeah. are you're on social media as well, or like me? Are you on Instagram? I'm on Instagram. Yeah. Okay. Instagram and Facebook. I think I saw. Yes. 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 Okay. I will be sure to leave links um, to both of those in case people want to reach out to you, as well as your website. Well, uh, I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you so much for uh, <laughs> thank, thank you, you. So much for your patience and your oh. flexibility to to make this happen. I'm so glad I had an opportunity to chat with you. I feel like I learned so much. I've been sober a lot. Look, we got sober very close this together. Is, yes, I know. That's amazing. That's great. I know, um, but I, I listen. I feel like I learned so much from you today, and I just want to thank you. Take a moment to say thank you for all the work that you're doing to, you know, those, that next generation of teenagers who need the guidance and the love and the understanding that you're bringing to them. I mean, I, I'm literally getting chills. I just thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. It's really important. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. (laughs) Yay. Well, I look forward to speaking with you again. Yay. Okay. Thanks, Wendy. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. One last thing before you go, if you enjoyed the podcast today, please don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review. And if you'd like to make a donation to the podcast and help me keep the lights on, you can do so by visiting odatchat.com. There's a donation button or membership button on the right hand side. Have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us.